Ever get the feeling you're being watched? Oh God, my heart is pounding. My throat's dry and I'm already starting to sweat. I hope I don't fall off the stage. And what if I forget what I'm supposed to say? Oh no, everyone's looking at me. I wonder what they're thinking. Because I know they're all judging me. Now why did I think this was a good idea again? Fear. We all have it, don't we? Whether on the stage delivering a talk or behind our desks pitching for work. Those unwelcome voices bounce around our head reminding us that we're not good enough and that there's someone else out there that could do a better job. Perhaps we should just play it safe and stick to the easy stuff, right? No, wrong. I am Julie Crefield, plus size marathon runner, global business owner and single parent. And every day I wake up in an absolute panic thinking, what is the world going to throw at me today? And you know what? That uncertainty, well, it feels pretty incredible. So this morning, I'm here to talk to you about the F word. No, not that one, because I promised Jeremy that I wouldn't swear. And no, it's not the word fat either, although I quite like that one. I mean, for a long time growing up, I actually thought that was my name. I was called fat so often. No, today I'm here to talk to you about fear and how you can use it to accelerate and bolster your speaking career. I'm going to share some of my own personal fears and what I've learned about, them, about myself through them and hopefully get you to identify some of yours too so you can use fear to guide you rather than having it stop you in your tracks. But why the interest in fear, I hear you ask? Did you know in the UK, two million fewer women than men play sport because of fear? The fear of judgment, the fear of not being good enough, and sadly for many, the fear of being laughed at. I mean, I should know. The first time I ever did a race, some little scallywag shouted out, run, fat girl, run. And I sat in crying in my car, saying, that's it, I'm never running again. Of course I did. But you see, women come to me not because they're afraid of bad health or getting diabetes or heart attacks as a result of their weight. They come to me because they don't always have the courage to run in public. Or they're afraid to go for their goals because they don't believe they'll achieve them. So where do all these fears come from? When I was putting this talk together, I tried to remember the first time I ever felt fear. Because we all know, right, that we're born with just two fears. The fears of heights and the fear of loud noises. So my earliest memory was when I was about two and a half and we were on holiday on the Costa del Somewhere and I got chased by a crab. Mum was sitting there on her sun lounger in all of her 1980s splendour and all of a sudden she heard me scream. I was being chased up and down the beach by this tiny crab and every time I changed direction, the crab did too. And rather than come and rescue me, my mum and dad, and the rest of the beach by all accounts, just sat there drinking their pina coladas and laughing. So yeah, I don't like crabs or spiders or anything that crawls basically. And let's not even go there when it comes to bees and wasps. Okay, so tell me, what is it that you're scared of? Perhaps it's the dark, or is it clowns? Or maybe it's waking up next to Donald Trump. <laughs> so come on, shout out, what are your fears? So let me ask you this. Is the fear the actual thing? Or is it something else hiding behind it? Let me explain. I don't really like making phone calls. You could say I'm quite fearful of it, but I'm not actually scared of using a telephone because I do it most days. What I'm actually scared of is not being understood by the person on the other end or being ignored or rejected. So often I send an email or a Facebook message because it feels kind of safer, which I know isn't that great for building relationships with people. So realising your fears is kind of the first step and then comes understanding them. So it has been an interesting exercise looking back to my childhood for memories around fear because I realised growing up I actually chased fear. I was one of six children and with money being tight we had to find ways to entertain ourselves so fear would often feature in our games. For example I would ride my bike all the way around my neighbourhood literally until I got lost. One time I cycled from Upton Park to Barking and ended up on a dual carriageway and had to be brought home by the traffic police. Mum wasn't very impressed with that. 
And we used to play this really cool game when my parents were out called Dark Creepers. It was also, it was a bit like hide and seek, but basically you switched off all the lights, draw the curtains and everyone went to hide in the dark. Then the finder had to creep around the house, occasionally calling out, Dark Creepers, Dark Creepers. Now that was some real scary stuff. But there's one incident from my childhood that absolutely beats all others when it comes to feelings of fear and I would love to share it with you. Sitting in my pyjamas with my back against my bedroom door, legs wedged against the chest of drawers to stop anyone coming into my room. I knew I was in big trouble. My heart was pounding as my eight-year-old body did did its best to stop my six-foot-tall dad from coming into my room and giving me what for. Breathe, Julie, breathe, and whatever you do, don't let him in. I was scared of what he might do if he did get in, but I was also laughing a little bit at what had just happened, what I had just had the nerve to do. It was Sunday night in the Creffield household. We'd all had our baths and we're in our pyjamas getting ready for bed, and we'd just watched the game show Gladiators on the TV. And now we were beating each other up and jumping off the arms of the sofa, pretending to be jet or lightning, much to the frustration of my mum. The twins, who were just three, were hanging off of each of Dad's feet. Jenny and Lindsay were trying to tie his hands up with a dressing gown belt. And me and my older brother, Gary, were taking it in turns to hit Dad over the head with the cushions. And that's when it happened. Dad grabbed both of my hands and pulled me onto his lap, started to tickle me. Now, I hate being tickled, even now. So for me, all the fun and games had stopped and all I wanted to do now was get away. I tried everything, brute force, pleading with him, trying to wiggle out as Gary continued his attack, but nothing worked. And seriously, by now, I thought, if he carries on much longer, I might actually wet myself. And that's when I said it. The F word. I had just told my dad, who at the best of times I was scared of, to F off. The room went quiet. Mum looked up from her crossword. The twins instinctively let go of Dad's feet. And even the cat left the room, sensing something was up. I had just swore in front of my parents and it wasn't even a small swear word. I looked at Dad. Dad looked at me. And in a split second, taking full advantage of his shock, I managed to jump out of his embrace, head up the stairs, two at a time, not daring to look back. But I knew he'd come after me. I never in my whole life felt fear like I did that night. After about three minutes of him shouting and trying to get into my bedroom, he gave up and went downstairs, whereby I could hear him and my mum laughing about it. The following morning, nothing more was said about it, but he never dared to tickle me again. I learned a very valuable lesson that night. Never swear at someone bigger than you unless you can run away faster. Now, why do I tell you this story? Because I've got hundreds of examples of times when I've felt fear. But none have had the amount of impact that this one has. It's kind of become like Creffield folklore. There isn't a family occasion that goes by without someone saying, do you remember that time that Julie told Dad to F off? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Telling this story without the actual use of that word has been quite challenging. I'm a working class girl from the East End and, you know, me being authentically me involves the occasional swear word sometimes. But I've been warned that the PSA stage is not the place for that. Unless you're doing comedy, of course, but more about that later. When I first remembered this story, I realised it was quite a personal one and I did worry a little bit about sharing it with you guys. My mum and dad sadly got divorced a few years after that night. Nothing to do with me swearing, uh, but I haven't had a relationship with my dad in more than 25 years. And it's probably one of my most treasured memories of him in a weird kind of way. Almost like I was preempting him leaving. But I believe there is something quite special about opening yourself up to your audience with stories and memories that mean something to you. Yes, it makes you vulnerable, but it also makes you human and therefore supports the know, like and trust theory. It happens in my writing, in my blogs and books and in the videos I make for the ladies I coach. Women are inspired by the honest accounts of coming last in race or being shouted at in the street. It helps them to understand that these things don't just happen to them. So could you be more open in your speaking? Could you find and use more personal stories that help people make sense of the world? And could you deliver them without fear of judgment? I set up my blog, The Fat Girl's Guide to Running, in 2010 after coming dead last in a race. 
I was so slow, by the time I got to the finish line, the finish line wasn't there. Neither was anyone else. I didn't even get a flipping banana. At first I was embarrassed that people would be judging me for my out-of-shape body, and then I felt angry. Angry that I hadn't trained hard, harder, and angry that the event organisers hadn't looked mm. after me better. And then I realised what a funny story it was, and actually didn't really care what other people thought about me anyway. And so the blog was born. In the early days, my blog was anonymous. I never posted any photos through fear of ridicule, and I never disclosed my real name. I was just known as Fatty. Or my full name, Fatty Must Run, which is still my Twitter handle if ever you wanted to tweet and say what a great speaker I am. But anyway, the point is this. The blog was an outlet for me to write about the realities of being a plus-size runner and to express my deepest fears about running this impending marathon. I now help overweight and inactive women all over the world to face their fears and to help them set and achieve huge running and health-related goals. You could say I have a large female following. I do. Her name is Brenda. She comes to all my races and she brings me donuts and Vaseline for my chafing. So let me ask, has anyone here ever run a marathon? Okay, a couple. Let me tell you, running your first marathon is like having your first baby. You know it's going to hurt, you just don't know how much. Lining up at the start line, there is no other feeling like it. Because for the next few hours, or in my case six, anything could happen. And I do mean anything. You might not finish. That's a big one. You could fall over. You could get cramp. <laughs> you could get the runs. You could die. So many people have said that to me. Lots of people die running marathons, you know. Yeah, and lots of people die because they don't, I always say. And apparently, one in 98,000 marathon runners will die while running a marathon. But one in 100,000 people will quite shockingly die playing a board game. Risky business, that monopoly. So yes, I do run marathons. I run them very slowly. In fact, I worked out the other day that Paula Radcliffe runs her marathons three times faster than me. But I'm four times fatter. So that makes me the stronger runner, right? But me and Paula, you know, we do have quite a bit in common. We're both blonde, we're both mums, and we both have a tendency to cry when things don't go our way. I've never peed myself in public, though. Well, not with a live TV audience, that's for sure. So sometimes when I do gigs and I'm described as one of the UK's favourite blonde marathon runners, the audience is often a little disappointed when I come on the stage and probably sitting there thinking, wow, Paula Radcliffe's let herself go. I remember the first time I said I wanted to run a marathon and everyone laughed. I get why they laughed. I was hugely overweight, completely inactive and couldn't even run to the top of my road. It was 2005 and I was working as a project manager on the London Games, trying to get local people to feel inspired. But I felt like a bit of a fraud. I wasn't exactly living the Olympic and Paralympic values, you know, like excellence and respect or courage. So on the day that we were to find out if we would be awarded the Games, you know, that moment where the French dude had the envelope and we was all on the edge of our seats. I said to my colleagues, if London gets the Games, I'll run the marathon in 2012. And the 2012 Olympic Games is awarded to the city of London. And there my fate was sealed because I'm a girl of my word. If I say I'm going to do something, especially if I say it publicly, I do it. Now, you may have no interest in running a marathon, but I bet you there's some kind of massive goal that you have that inspires you and terrifies you in equal measure. A goal which fills you with dread, even though you know it would help you move towards the life that you really want to lead. In terms of your speaking business, it could be anything. It could be, you know, getting your first big keynote or charging the fee you want to charge, writing a book, appearing on TV, meeting Oprah Winfrey. Or is that just me? <laughs> it's the kind of goal that nags away at you. The ones that create all those annoying voices that give you a million reasons why you can't do it instead of the one hard to ignore reason why you must. I call these my big, fat, stupid goals. They're big because of their scale, they're fat because of their juicy, indulgent nature, and they're stupid because people just don't think you'll ever achieve them. Maybe even you. These are by no stretch of the imagination smart goals, because I'm not really a fan of smart goals. In fact, I hate smart goals. I think smart goals stop people from thinking big and just going for it. You know, achieving things by any means necessary. Cowboy style. Running a marathon wasn't realistic for me. It wasn't. And in terms of it being time-based, if I hadn't got a place for 2012, I would have done it the following year. In my opinion, when a goal is too structured, it leaves far too much room for things to go wrong. Too many opportunities to bail out. 
So let's get you thinking about what your big, fat, stupid goals could be for your speaking. Go wild, think big, and just don't worry about re being realistic and all of that crap. Write your big, fat, stupid goal down on the little pink card that was on your seat. So, do we all have one? Now, close your eyes and take a moment to think about how great it would feel to achieve that goal. What would people think of you? What would you think of yourself? Okay, open your eyes. Now, what would you say if I told you I wanted you to share it with the person next to you? Go on, it's not that scary. Give it a go. 30 seconds to share your big, fat, stupid goal with your neighbour. Now, what if I told you I wanted to share you to share your goal publicly on Facebook or LinkedIn or to stand up now and reveal what it is to the rest of the room? Anyone a little bit frightened by this? So this kind of reminds me of something that happened a few years ago. I was on an England athletics coaching uh, course and all of the other coaches were really fit, you know, your traditional running, running coach type people. And then there was me. And at the end of the day, we were asked to write a goal that had come out of the day. And one by one, we were asked to read out what we'd written down. And of course, they picked me first. Mine read, I want to be considered the world's leading expert in plus size fitness. And that's when I heard the laughter. And as a result, I kind of started laughing too and played it off like I was being ironic. I wasn't. I was being deadly serious. Why are other people so quick to rubbish your dreams? Is it because they're too scared to sit, set big ones of their own? And why are we so scared to share our innermost desires? We're back to fear again. So prior to doing all this running stuff, as I said before, I worked for eight years as a project manager on the London 2012 Games. But the morning after the opening ceremony and with no prior warning whatsoever, I was called into my boss's office and I was made redundant. I was seven months pregnant at the time. It was an almighty shock and for a long, long time it felt very, very personal. So I put my career on hold and I focused on being a mum for a while. But with a very fragile relationship with my daughter's dad, I knew I had to start making my own money again and quickly. But how? I was an expert on London 2012 and 2012 wasn't there anymore. I could hardly get on a plane and go to Rio with a baby in tow, could I? So I went along to a local business development centre to get some advice about turning my blog into a business. And this is what he said. What you have here, love, it's not a business, it's a hobby. It's all about your ego. It's all you, you, you. And you'll never make any money from it. He was wrong. Now what I do is very niche, but luckily for me it's a growing niche. I've got 40,000 followers on social media and have thousands of women around the world that go through my online programmes. And I'm now considered a global expert on plus size fitness. That man didn't understand my business and he didn't understand me. Don't get me wrong though, his comments did feed into my little voice. You know, the internal commentary that helps you to play small. Who am I to be doing this? I'm not smart enough. What if people laugh at me? Oh, I could never be so bold. Do you have a little voice too? Oh, I'm too old, too female, too ethnic, too tall, too working class, too shy. What's your two story? Is it serving you or are you using it as an excuse, an opportunity to play safe? The big question is, how do we stop these little voices? And how do we create resilience to help you continually move forward for whatever it is you want to achieve? I joined the PSA three years ago after attending Mega. At the time, I was not a professional speaker. I didn't really understand what one was. I had just been doing a bit of radio and some podcasts and stuff and wondered if I could monetize it. I was in a pretty crappy place in my life, really. I'd been made redundant. I was living on benefits. And I was stuck at home with a new baby, about to become a single parent. Life couldn't have got any worse. It sounds cliche, but it was a real turning point in my life. I wasn't scared of what I had to do. I was scared of what the alternative was and therefore knew that I had to take action. I can remember going to Mega and thinking, everyone's going to be richer than me, smarter than me, slimmer than me, better dressed. I needn't have worried. I had a fabulous convention, and I remember when the last speaker of the weekend came on, a guy called Craig Goldblatt, and he gave a really moving speech about love. I cried, real ugly tears, and I thought, this is what I want to do with my life. And then once back home, you know, I fell into the negative mindset of, who do you think you are, Julie? 
People like you don't become motivational speakers. I did, however, take action. After a little bit of nagging from Alan Stevens, I did join the PSA. And when I first started coming to London meetings, I'd hide away at the back. I never asked questions and I felt a bit like a fraud. Everyone else were proper speakers with proper topics and I was just this fat bird who ran marathons. But bit by bit, I got to know people and one day, probably a year or so into coming, I made the choice to sit at the front. I even answered a question. I realised that day that I didn't need permission from anyone and that by facing up to my fears, there were immediate benefits. And I decided that I would at some point speak on the PSA London stage, even if the thought of it terrified me. It still does. Author Susan Jeffers said we need to feel the fear and do it anyway. But I think it's not simply about bulldozing your way through your fears. I think we need to take time to analyse them. Because it's in between that space of fear and action where the learning and the growth takes place. It's not about eliminating the fear, it's about using it as a barometer to guide you through your life. So looking back at all of the big scary things I've done, I reckon I've followed a system. Which is great because all the best motivational speakers have a system, right? I call mine the going the distance system. It's good, isn't it? You know, what with all the marathon running and that. Anyway, I'm going to quickly run through it with you, which is funny because I never run anywhere quickly. But here we go. Step one, face your fears. People often say to me, Julie, you are fearless. But the truth is, I am fearful much of the time. I've always had an irrational fear of public speaking, but it is always featured in my jobs. So now I do it for a living and the fear still hasn't gone. But it's what drives me to get better and better. Nobody wants their audience to think they're shit because, come on, let's face it, that's what fear is all about. It's the fear of rejection or ridicule. But what's the worst that could happen? Now, some of you all know that I did the infamous PSA comedy night at Mega last year. Uh, someone said to me, what have you got to lose? Which I thought was a bit rude. It was about three stone. You know, it was scary as hell going up onto that stage in front of my peers. But I now have content to use in my talks that make people laugh. And I've got the experience of that level of pressure. Step two, create good habits. You don't have to be good straight away. Because come on, let's face it, that's what often stops us from doing stuff, right? The fear of being rubbish. I've made a career out of it. I'm quite a rubbish runner. I'm a rubbish blogger. I'm even a rubbish parent sometimes. I always say to my clients, if you want to be a runner, you just have to run. Don't worry about being good. And if you want to be a writer, you just have to write. You can get better as you go along. Consistency is key. People ask me, how do you run for six hours? Easy. One footstep at a time. Of course, I have milestones along the way, but each step is very much like the last. It's not difficult. It's just a habit. I've written six books and hundreds of blog posts in the last three years. Plus, I keep an extensive journal. I write every day. It doesn't matter if some of it's tripe. Some of it won't be. Step three, improve your technique. So now you're actually doing it, you can start thinking about improving. I always encourage my women to get to running a 5K without stopping before we start looking at technique or improving speed. It makes sense, right? And in your speaking career, it's kind of the same principle. I think you should get as much practice as possible and then start working on your technique by getting a coach or doing a course. But there are some areas of your business where this just doesn't apply. You can't be good at everything and sometimes you need to delegate. So the stuff that's outside of your zone of excellence or you simply hate doing, get someone else to do it. I have a graphic designer, an accountant and a cleaner. Yes, a cleaner. I hate cleaning. What she can do in two hours on a Monday morning for 20 quid would take me all day and I'd be in a bad mood for the rest of the week. Which leads me nicely on to step number four. Build your team. Some people think that marathon running is a solo sport and that being a speaker is the same. But we don't do things in isolation, do we? And it's taken a whole team effort to get me here on the stage today. Your support team can come in many different forms. There's your loved ones, of course, but then there's also the people that form a more official part of your team. Your VA, your accountant, a mastermind, mentor, coach, perhaps. The PSA is fantastic in terms of expanding your team, but this only works if you ask for the help. Who do you have around you that will build you up? But equally, who do you have that will give you brutal advice when you need it? I remember Nigel Risner agreeing to give me some mentoring and he took one look at my website and went, it's shit. I wouldn't book you if I was a speaker booker. 
It was harsh, but it was true. And sometimes we need that. And now my new speaker website is currently in development. And finally, celebrating success. Remember, success isn't just one big shiny moment in your year. It's a series of things that go right. Things that you've done well. You. I remember a few years ago saying, oh, if only I could get on TV. So you can imagine how I felt when the phone call came. Hi, this is Tom. I'm a producer from ITV's This Morning and we were wondering if you would like to head up a six-week feature called Run For Your Life. Oh, of course I did. And it was, of course, a moment to celebrate. I thought, wow, finally, success. But actually, the real success had come six months before when I'd been leading small retreats in East London. One lady enjoyed it so much she came back twice. Turns out she was head of drama at ITV. I didn't know this. And she went back and spoke to her friend, head of daytime, and said, you've got to get this girl on your show. Doing that small workshop well was the success. So we need to celebrate and enjoy those moments that signify progress. And we need to tell other people about them too. Show off. So there it is. There's the system that I use to face my fears and set and achieve big, fat, stupid goals. Face your fears. Create good habits. Improve your techniques or delegate. Build your team and celebrate your success. It's not a linear system, though. You have to keep running through the steps in a circular motion. It's not like you tackle a fear once and then it's gone. Sometimes they morph into other things because they're sneaky little so-and-sos, these fears. Now... As well as fear, I did promise you some other F words, didn't I? Um, And I'm currently writing a book called Fear and Other F Words, so I do have a few to choose from. But I've selected the three most appropriate for for today. So here they are. Fame. I get women from all over the world messaging me. I get asked for photos at races and I feature in magazines. Recently, a mechanic who was fixing my car said, Oi, you're that fat woman off the TV that runs. My wife loves you. But the funny thing is, I've got no desire to be famous. But what I do have is a message that I want to share with the world. And I can't do that anonymously from behind my computer. Don't be scared for the world to see you. Or think you have to wait until you lose weight or get a better wardrobe or a better haircut. You're awesome, just as you are. And the world needs your message. Fortune. What I've learned is when I chase the money... It simply doesn't come. Yet when I do the work that I know I'm called to do, the income just kind of arrives. But don't be scared of money. There's plenty of it around. You just need to know your value. And sometimes the fortune comes in other shapes. Last year, I attracted £30,000 worth of free trips, sports kit and free services into my business. And at the end of the month, I'm being flown out to Tel Aviv on a six-day, all-expenses trip where I'll write about running a half marathon. And I am sure to be the fattest journalist there. And finally, thank you. Look, in the East End, we say thank, not thank. So in my books, this one still counts as an F word. And it's all about gratitude. Be grateful for the things that work out and the things that don't. Be appreciative of the people that support you, inspire you, believe in you and show that gratitude. Give stand innovations where they're deserved and feedback when you genuinely think you can help. This is an incredible tribe that we've found ourselves in and I give thanks for them. Thanks for it every day. Before I leave, though, I just want to share one final thing with you, which is my big, fat, stupid goal for 2017. Well, simply put, I want to become an international speaker. Yep, that's right. It's what I want to do. It scares the hell out of me, and I've got no idea how I'm going to juggle it with being a single parent. But that's the goal. Now, the day after setting this intention for myself back in November, a call for speakers for the PSA South Africa convention came up on my Facebook feed. And I nervously applied, and much to my surprise, I was accepted. Last week, I was invited to speak at a convention about physical activity in Copenhagen. So it's happening. You just have to dream big, guys. You have to say what you want and take inspired action. And then the universe will do the rest. You just have to have faith that you are ready, even if you're not. Standing on this stage has been incredibly scary, but I know great things will come from it. So get yourself up here as soon as you can, because seriously, there's nothing like it. Be brave, be bold, be kind and be happy. Face those fears and get out there in 2017 and achieve those big, fat, stupid goals.